Hi there, welcome to Net Invest. I am developing an investing checklist at this point in time, and it's going actually quite well. I've developed the first iteration, and this is not the end of the process. I do expect to this um, investing checklist to evolve rapidly through the next few months, and then more slowly as I become more happy with the checklist itself. So this is part two to this series. I've already um, recorded part one, which was an introduction to the investing list checklist, talking about why I'm doing it, that sort of things, what I'm going to include. And the three criteria, I think in the previous video, I called these filters, but the three criteria I will be using in my investing checklist are, Quality, value, and sentiment. I probably would argue that a lot of uh, investing checklists don't include sentiment at all. They're just looking at quality, potentially value, those sort of things, and completely miss the sentiment. Now, to be honest with you, sentiment is not as important for high-quality companies. In fact, for high-quality companies, value is more important. You want to buy those companies when they're good value and potentially sentiment does not matter at all. When you do talk about lower quality companies, value is probably not as much of an issue. It's all to do with sentiment. And the reason behind that is low quality companies are low quality for a reason. And sometimes their value can be quite low. We've seen that right now with quite a few companies on the ASX that are would consider to be low quality and the share price keeps on falling. So what you wanna wait is for a shift in sentiment because some of these companies could go bankrupt or could go under. So you want to see that shift in sentiment. You want to see the share price turning up before you want, really want to invest in those low quality companies. So even though I do have three criteria, not every single company will be treated equally. So high quality companies, Pro Medicus, that company is all about the value. If I see really good value when I talk about that company, that's when I will invest, even if sentiment is negative or neutral at that point in time. Now, when it comes to the quality criteria, I've broken it down into three sections or parts for simplicity reasons, because in my spreadsheet, quality section is quite long and I just got sick of scrolling across. So I've decided to break it down into three parts just to make it a little bit easier. And those three parts are quality, growth and profitability. So when we're talking about quality, it's just so the, sort of the overall quality of the company. So looking at different um, filters or metrics for that, including return on equity, uh, return on invested capital, weighted average cost of capital, shares on issue. That is something else I'm looking at. If a company continually increases the shares on issue, I would consider that to be a lower quality company. Now, you do have to be careful because a company can make an acquisition fairly large acquisition and shares on issue can double. But I would also argue that is a risk moving forward for that company. Yes, I'm looking at you, Slater and Gordon. They made a massive acquisition, increased the shares on issue, and that was a downfall for that company. So major acquisitions can be a risky prospect for some companies. So you could argue that quality companies won't have to do those major acquisitions that would lead to a significant increase in shares on the issue. So those are some of the things I'm looking at quality. And this is not at this point in time, I've not locked these uh, metrics in and more than likely it will change over time. Second thing I'm definitely looking for here is growing companies. I want some growth when it comes to profits, free cash flow, operating cash flow, those sort of things. And I'm also looking at it on a per share basis. So a company can be growing the shares on issue and in, effect, in actual fact, not be growing when you look at the per share profits or per share operating cash flow, free cash flow, earnings per share is another one I'll be looking at. And profitability. I think I put earnings per share into the profitability section. I can't remember quite now, but I would prefer a company to be profitable, to be operating cash flow positive, free cash flow positive doesn't necessarily mean I won't invest in that company, but it would mean it is a lower quality company. Now to value, and this is something I am working on um, a fair bit right now, um, as I go into the second week of this process. The first um, factor when I'm looking at value is historical. 
So I'm going back over the past 10 years of a company and looking at the historical valuations for that company. So PE ratio, price to sales ratio, price to book ratios, the price to operating cash flow ratios over the past 10 years, average it out. And what is that ratio right now compared to historical value? And that is uh, one way I've done it in the past to judge the value of a company. And it's actually worked really well in the past. So that is something I'm definitely going to include in my value section or value criteria, relative valuation. So comparing a company's value to another company's value. So the PE ratio, price to sales ratio, price to book ratio, particularly a company that is in a similar sector. You also can compare companies throughout the whole ASX. For instance, one of the things I might be looking at is price to operating cash flow. Think of a number, say six or seven, and any company with a price to operating cash flow less than six might be good value. Anything, any company with a price operating cash flow of greater than 20 might be a little bit expensive. The only reason I don't like that is some companies, uh, just because of the business itself, will have high price operating cash flow or low price operating cash flow. So I think lumping all companies into the one basket is probably not the best way to value a company. And that's why I do like to look at historical values for a company. Now, going back to historical values, I actually have bought and sold the banks the big four banks based off their historical values. It has worked wonderfully well in the past. So definitely it is a way to judge the value, the current value of a company is just looking at the historical values and looking where it sits right now. Also traditional methods of value a company. So uh, discounted cash flows, those sort of things. I haven't really used those traditional sort of ways of value a company in the past. I think there's a lot of problems with uh, judging or valuing a company based off that, but I can see the merit. More than likely, the sort of, instead of using a discounting cash flow, sort of use a reverse discounting cash flow. So reverse discounting, discounting cash flow would be looking at the valuation of a company now and um, saying it would have to grow at 10% per year to justify the valuation of the company right now. I think that's the better way to use those sort of uh, discounted cash flows um, sort of systems is actually doing a reverse way and looking at how fast the company has to grow to justify the price or the value of the company right now. I might do that, have it decided if I'm going to include that in my value criteria. And here is uh, the beginnings of my checklist. So this is using Excel online at the moment. I am importing data from Guru Focus, and I do have problems with importing Guru Focus in my normal Excel. So I had to revert to Google Sheets initially and then to go into Google uh, Excel online because Google Sheets has a limit to how much data you can import because I'm importing a lot of data. Now, this changes every single day. So every single day, uh, there's, the data is reloaded. So I don't have to do any tinkering with the numbers here at all. Now, this is the initial sheet I do have. So I have quite a few sheets here. So at the moment, I've imported 160 companies and to import a company doesn't take much time at all. So that's the whole point of me doing this is all I have to do is 160 companies at this point, I think, 155 at the moment. And all I have to do is just um, import the ASX code and then everything else gets, um, automatically put in here, including the company's name. So this is alphabetical. So the first name on the company in alphabetical in terms of the ticket code. So the first company is Pointera because it's, their ticket code is 3DP. The, the, the date of their float is very important to me. And the reason that's important is because I've already realized when we're talking quality, the amount of time the company has been listed on the ASX is important. So a company that hasn't been listed for very long will have a, a, a lower quality score. Now that could be a problem or it could be um, a reasonable assumption to make that a company that hasn't been listed too long on the ASX is going to be lower quality just because we don't have as much financial data for that company. So one of the ways to get around that possibly is just to know how long the company has been listed. So I've got a float there. Uh, for instance, Point Terra, the company, not the company itself, but uh, the company before Point Terra was listed in 2008 and then there was a backdoor listing, those sort of things. The last financial update is very important here. Uh, so last time Point Terra was updated was the 28th of 
February, which would have been the half yearly results. And you notice here that IIS has nothing in or any values here. That's because they are going under a consolidation and the T code right now to trade that company is something like AISB or something like that. And that's because of that consolidation process. Now, having the last financial update here was important because there is a company, Baylor Technology, says the last time there was a financial update there was 2017. Now that company is still on the ASX. And I know that because I've actually invested into Baylor Technology. So you'd have to be wary of companies that haven't been updated. So that's one problem with Guru Focus. And I actually might uh, inform them of that. I have informed them of some problems with their ASX companies. So you probably notice here that I do have ASX colon and then the name of the company. I will also do this for American companies. So in American companies, all you have to do, and here it is, all you have to do is the ticket code. So to know it's an Australian company, you have to put that ASX there. Uh, so that's um, it's no big issue. Um, for me anyway. Uh, so the next thing I've got here is the price of the company, the market cap revenue. So the only absolute when it comes to my investing checklist is I want to only invest in companies with revenue. There's a company called Helixa something, something. Um, I forget exactly what. HXL, uh, share price decreased 84% uh, late June um, and has decreased another 50% since then, or maybe even more than that. And that's a biotech company in phase one or phase two trials, and it failed their phase one. Uh, and I don't want to invest in those sort of companies that there is a binary outcome. It's either going to be successful or unsuccessful. If they're unsuccessful, the share price will drop almost 99%. That's what's happened for this one company. In fact, I might do a video on that company over the next few days. So revenue is very important. I want a product that that company is selling or something or service that company is selling. I want it to be a real company. So no mining exploration companies, no biotechs that are in phase one without any revenues, no concept stocks at this point in time. So that's just a change or a shift in strategy I am undergoing because I am moving into part-time work. Operating cash flow, free cash flow, profit. I would prefer to buy into companies that are profitable have free cash flow operating cash flow. And then it comes to my scoring system. So I have a quality score out of 23, a quality percentage. So just divide uh, the score from the company by 23, you get a quality percentage. The value of the company looking at historical values at this point in time. So whether when you look at P ratio, price of sales, price of book, price of operating cash flow, whether the company right now exceeds those historical values. And when I say historical values, I'm looking at a 10-year median. So that's all I'm looking at, a 10-year median for the company and whether the valuations of those or those metrics for those companies exceed that 10-year median. Then I come with an overall score. All I do is times the quality score by the value. I get a score, positive or negative. Any score that is negative, for instance, A2 milk, yeah, let's have a look at A2 Milk. So A2 Milk has a, vet, a quality of 43.5%. And that's understandable because of the pressures this company has gone under over the past year and a half. If you went back to 2020 and did this, there is a chance that A2 Milk would have a quality score of approaching probably 100% almost, maybe 95, 100%. So right now they have a much lower quality score. Value, negative 1.46. So based off historical ranges of this company, P ratio and all those things, this company would be undervalued, but there could be a reason for that. And the overall score is negative 63.7. So one of the things I've come to realize is that when you look at the overall score and whether a company is cheap or you know fairly cheap right now, there could be a reason behind that. And one of those reasons is it's cheap for a reason. There is problems with the overall company, structural problems. So a very low score or overall score could be putting out to value traps or really good value propositions. So will I go through, yeah, I won't go through, yeah, we'll go through these. In fact, we'll go back here and we'll look at a company that looks really cheap right now. And I might be a little bit biased and this is Clinville Pharmaceuticals. So it has a price of $16.83, markup of 831 million. Revenue 56.9 million, operating cash flow positive, free cash flow positive, 
profitable, has a quality score of 96%. So this is a high quality company. So let's have a look at how I determine whether Cleanerville is a high quality company going through the quality, growth and profit um, parts of the quality criteria. So with the uh, quality criteria, I look at shares on issue. So shares on issue for Cleanerville have not changed all that much over the past five years. So I'm looking at the last five years. There's only been 3.7 growth in shares on issue over the past five years. If you go to look at some other companies, for instance, uh, what's another company here? Point Terra. Shares on issue have grown from 326 million to 678 million, so 107.6. So I'm going to give that company a zero because shares on issue have grown a lot over the past two years or five years. But for Cleanerville, they get to two. So I'm also looking at debt to equity. So debt's very important to me. I want to invest in companies that don't or won't be burdened by debt in the long run because the main reason companies go bankrupt is because of debt. And Cleanerville has no problems with debt. In fact, they have a debt to equity of point. Zero one, and I'm also looking at cash to debt. And at this moment, uh, Clinderville have a cash to debt of 84.6. So they have significant amount of cash compared to debt. A lot of companies here have very low cash to debt. For instance, Codan 0.12, um, Chorus. I think this is Chorus C and U that have 0.03. So I prefer to buy or invest in companies that have high cash levels compared to debt. Also looking at return on invested capital weighted average cost of capital, and those get a pretty big ticks for Clinerville. Also return on equity, 25.46. I give that a score of two. So I'm looking at different ranges here. So anything, I think, let's have a look at the ranges here. So anything less than 10 in terms of return on equity gets a zero. And then anything uh, greater than 20 gets a two. Anything in between 10 and 20 gets a one. So that's my return on equity score. Same, I do the same sort of thing with with our return on invested capital and weighted average cost of capital. So overall, there's a total score of nine and Clinerville gets an absolute perfect score when it comes to quality. So I consider based off this particular checklist that Clinerville is a high quality company. Now when it goes, let's, let's have a look at growth with Clinerville. So I'm looking at three year revenue growth, operating cash flow growth, um, free cash flow growth, Dividend growth, that's something else I'm looking. Also, equity. So I'm looking at increase in equity in a three-year span. Also, earnings per share. More than likely, I'm going to change this over time and also look at five-year growth, potentially even 10-year growth. And I'll talk about why in a second. But when you look at Clinerville over the last three years, they're growing revenue at 22% per year. Operating cash flow, 17% per year. Uh, free cash flow, 15% per year. Equity has more than doubled. And also earnings per share has grown at 22% per year. So overall, this company gets a nine out of 10. Some other companies here like Coden gets a 10 out of 10. Uh, Domino's Pizza gets a 10 out of 10. Uh, EOL gets a 10 out of 10 as, as well. So the main thing I'm looking for is really good consistent growth over at least a three year period. And more than likely, I'm gonna change this or include five year growth and 10 year growth as well. And the main reason for that is when you look at BHP here, so BHP gets a pretty scored score, 10 out of 10, when you look at the last three years in terms of growth. But when you expand that to five or 10 years, you get a different story. So let's just have a look at BHP. So this is going, looking at Guru Focus. And this is their revenue growth. Actually, I'll just zoom on here. See if I can zoom on here. So this is the revenue over the past 11 years. And it, revenue for BHP has not grown over the past 11 years, but over the past three years, it has grown. Even the past five years, revenue has grown. But the, you know, over the past 11 years, the best years in terms of revenue this company was experienced was back in 2011 and 2012. And revenue since then has actually gone backwards. So looking at the larger time frame is very important. It's very important, particularly when you're referring to commodity companies. So that's one thing I'm gonna to have to change here is because a lot of commodity driven companies or mining companies do have a high score. So BHP has a 10 and quite a few other companies here have a 10. I'd probably say Fortescue Metal has a 10 here. Um, what other companies do at GRR? Grange Resources have a 10 in terms of growth. But when you look at the bigger picture, the longer time frames, these companies probably more than likely would not get a 10 I would not define 
mining companies as high quality companies. But in my criteria, my quality criteria, they do get high scores. So that is something I would want to change. And I think the way to change that is look at the longer term, particularly a 10-year period in terms of growth for these companies. Back to Clinivell, CUV. So that gets a good score when it comes to growth. Profitability, that should get a perfect score. So Clinivell is CUV. Should get a four out of four. So only four out of four right now. And more than likely this will change. But I'm looking at operating cash flow, free cash flow, profit, also gross margins. I really want gross margins to climb through time. So I'm looking at a 10-year meeting when it comes to gross margins. And I prefer gross margins of a company to be higher now than they have in the past 10 years. Not record highs, but at least higher than the medium in the past 10 years. If a company satisfies all those, they get a score out of four. So then you add all that up and you get uh, score out of 23 and just divide it by the, its score. And that's how Clinivill gets a score of 95.65. I'll go through some of the high quality companies that I have done, 155 companies. So I have, this is not complete. Not every single ISS company has included on here. Now let's have a look at value. So why does uh, Clinivill get a negative 1.27, which is actually fairly low? And just by looking at Clinivill, financial performance of this company, looking at the share price where it is right now, I would consider Clinivell to be really cheap at these levels, but there might be a reason behind it, but those reasons are unsure right now. So let's have a look at the value of Clinivell right now. And what are some things I am looking at? CUV. So for some reason, I put the end score right the first uh, column. So P ratio. So PE ratio of Clinivell right now is 35.73. The 10-year PE ratio median for Clinivell is 65.94. So you can see, looking at the last 10 years, on historical ranges, Clinivell is quite cheap. But if we did take a relative view, 35.73, when you look at a basket of ASS companies, that might be expensive. So that's one of the reasons why I might look at relative numbers. Um, P price to sales ratio. Historically, over the past 10 years, Clinivell has a price to sales ratio of 40.7. Right now, it's 15.2. Price to book, historically 13.4. Um, and right now, it's 7.8. Price to operating cash flow, historically for this company, 72.7. Right now, it's 31.6. So all these suggest that Clinivell, on historical basis, is good value right now. Now, you could argue that in the past 10 years, Clinivell has been overvalued. Now it's coming back to where it's okay value or fair value. That could be an argument you might have if it wasn't growing at a very quick rate. The last thing I've included here is a Guru Focus value. So Guru Focus does a value for every single company. And Guru Focus says the share price or fair value for Clinivell right now is $46.90. Current share price is $16.83. So overall, when you take all these numbers, so what I do is um, I look at the percentage difference between the medium and the value right now, add a warm up and divide it by five, you get a value of zero or minus 1.27. So what you're looking for here is a lower negative number. Uh, for instance, EOS, Electro Optic System, has a score of negative 4.6, but there is reasons behind that. And EOS, even though I'm an investor in a company, I would not describe that company as a high quality company at all. It's not profitable. Uh, even though it is growing at a fairly quick rate, they got, keep doing capital raising. So shares on issue are keep increasing for that company. So I think it could be good value, but the company is experiencing some problems. Clinivell is not doing that or having those problems. It's not experiencing any problems. And you can see that by the quality score, a fairly high quality score. So overall, you get some, you get an overall score. And what I'm looking for here is scores or really low scores. And in fact, I'll go to this analysis sheet. And what I've done here is I ranked companies on their value. Um, so we go from a value of 100, which is Grain Resources, Pro Medicus, and Shaver Shop. So Shaver Shop got a value score of 100, which uh, was a little bit surprising. Other really good value not very, yeah, good quality scores here include Coden, CSL, Clinivell, Fortescue Metals, JB Hi-Fi, Laser Bond, Objective Corp, Rio Tinto, PWR, 
Technology One, which is not surprising, BHP, Mineral Resources, Premier Investments, ResMed, Aristocrat, Blue Scope Steel, Fisher and Paykel, Supply Network, Wise Tech, uh, Bizaloy Steel, Hanson Technologies, John Lins Group, James Hardy, Linus Rare Earth, Temple Webstar. I shall stop at about 80%. And when I look at those companies, I would actually say many of those companies are high quality companies without me doing this scoring system. The only group of companies I probably would not say are high quality are those mining companies. But when you look at the bottom end of the list, the lower quality companies, uh, we're talking about AMP. Would you say AMP is a quality company? I can tell you right now, just looking at the performance of that company over the past 10, 15 years, it is not a quality company. Wise Way Group. Main reason behind that is they are a fairly small company, uh, haven't been long on the ASX either, and that does hint to some, hint to some companies. Gentrack, I actually have invested in Gentrack, so maybe I should change my opinion because this company um, either is really good value right now um, based off where it could be getting in the next five years, but when you do the quality score, it gets a very low quality score. Air New Zealand, Hello World, Qantas Airways. So again, a lot of travel stocks um, because those companies have experienced problems over the past few years. That's another problem with this system is it does look at the shorter term, so the last three years, and it judges quality on the last three years. So those companies who have experienced problems in the last three years would have a lower quality score. That's another reason why I want to expend, extend that period to at least 10 years. MMA offshore, which is not surprising, but we have seen a change in sentiment for that company. And I have actually invested in MA Offshore just because of a shift in sentiment. And so these lower quality companies, it's all about sentiment, in my opinion. St. Barbara, not surprising there. Freelancer, AMA Group, Star Entertainment, Catapult. I'm going to ignore Ballador Technology because they haven't updated their financial performance. Webjet, Event Hospitality, Auckland International Airport, Nitro, KMD, which is Kathmandu, Fleetwood, Coles Group. Coles Group was a bit surprising to see it down there. Service Stream, People In, Mitchell Services, Land Lease Group, Electro Optics, Coventry Group, Chorus, uh, Transurban, uh, Cube. Interesting to see Transurban there. But I've also noticed a lot of banks have had a fairly low quality score. Uh, Macquarie was really low as well, something like 70%, much lower than I thought. Wes Farmers is fairly low too. So uh, some quality companies or some companies which are considered to be high quality companies or burgeoning on high quality companies, actually fairly low in my quality score. Now let's have a look at uh, the overall score and I'll see if this will work. I have problems with sorting. Um, no, we want to do that the other way, sorting. Oops. Okay, so now we go to the value score. So the whole reason of doing this is looking at companies that might be really good value right now. But what I found is a lot of these companies potentially are value traps and they are really good value right now. Well, maybe I wouldn't, shouldn't say really good value, but they do look like they could be good value for a reason. The first one is integrated research, uh, electro optic systems, Northern Star resources. This is where it becomes interesting. So I was actually looking at Northern Star the other day and I was thinking, gee, this does look cheap. Uh, gold prices have fallen, but Northern Star is a pretty good quality company, even though I only got a score of 70 there, but it does look really good value right now. So that could be confirmation of my thinking that it could be good value. I would also say that Northern Star um, is a good quality company for a gold company, maybe the best quality a gold company on the ASX, but gold prices have fallen significantly. And I think that's the reason why Northern Star share price has fallen and why it might be seeing good value. If gold prices stay where they are right now, I think that quality score might come down a little bit. Temple and Webstar, is on here. Now that's an interesting one because that was a COVID-19 beneficiary just like Kogan. And the reason why the share price has fallen a lot is because of some uh, headwinds these companies are facing. So we've got in a row here, Temple and Webster, Kogan and Redbubble, fairly similar companies in terms of share prices increased in 2020 and have decreased significantly since then. Question is, are these companies good value? 
or will these headwinds continue? So the reason I would want to invest in these companies, or the only reason I might invest in these companies is if I do see a shift in sentiment, even though saying that, Temporal Webster value uh, score is 80, Kogan 48 and Redbubble 54. Email payments has seen significant problems in the past 18 months, has a value or quality score of 48 and value score of negative 1.9. So that could be good value, but a fairly low quality score. So you want to see a change in sentiment for that company, in my opinion. Sandfire Resources could be good value right now. That is a copper company. And I think they are... Uh, they do mine copper and copper has just fallen, although the price of copper has fallen off a cliff because people, the markets are expecting uh, countries to go in recession and copper is sort of like um, a proxy for the overall state or health of the economies. For some reason, um, that is one of the things we do look at when we're judging the state of the economies is copper prices. So there is a good correlation between copper prices and the state of the economy. AMA Group, that would be a very low quality score. Yep, 23.9 and uh, has a good value right now. So that could be good value right now. Uh, Blue Scope still bigger cheese. Share price is at a six or seven year low. Regis Resources, A2 Milk, Rio Tinto, Charter Hall. We have seen share price of that company fall away a lot. That is a high quality company with set at 78. And then Capricorn Metals, Maca Limited, JB Hi-Fi has a good quality score of 96 and could be undervalued right now at these prices. Uh, Megaport, Symbio Holdings, Brickworks, Ascent Group, New Hope, ANZ Bank. I mentioned earlier, um, some of the banks have very low quality scores. So ANZ Bank has a quality score of 43.5. I think there are reasons behind that. Uh, and I wouldn't actually say the banks are high quality I'd say they're okay, but definitely uh, 43.5 did surprise me. In Macquarie Group, I said mentioned earlier, I said earlier that I was surprised by the low score in Macquarie Group, but still 71.7 and overall score of negative 31, value of negative 4.4. So right now, it could be a good time to buy Macquarie Group because it is undervalued compared to historical ranges. So that's what I'm doing right now. And more than likely, this process will be ongoing. I've started with uh, US companies right now. And funny enough, and I haven't changed, uh, this is actually the very, very first iteration. And the only company got a perfect score in America was Microsoft, 100% uh, score, in fact, when it comes to quality. So according to my quality system, scoring system, Microsoft is the best quality company on the NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange. Some of the scores here, Google got 91. Um, TSM, which is Taiwan Semiconductors, whatever, got 93. Meta got 91. Um, Target got 81. Um, Costco, 85. NVIDIA, 93. Amazon only got a 59.5. Um, Home Depot, 85. Uh, WSM, Williams, Sonoma got a 90.48. So starting the press, this process on the United States, but I want to perfect this for America right now. Berkshire only got a quality score of 67. There you go. Alibaba, 67 as well. Um, anyway, so that's where I am right now. So that's all I have for this investing checklist uh, video, part two, the first iteration of this checklist. More than likely, I'll go through many iterations before I come to the point when I'm happy with this and we'll start using it on an ongoing basis. And I've still got a lot of research to do, a lot of papers to read. There are a lot of papers out there in terms of how to value a company, how to judge the quality of a company, those sort of things, and a lot of different thoughts out there. And I do believe that everyone out there, well, I wouldn't say everyone, but I do believe there's a lot of people out there who are smarter than me on this subject. So instead of developing this in checklist myself, just take bits and pieces from all these really smart people and develop a checklist that is going to satisfy me in the long run. And more than likely, I think this should be the goal of every investor out there is develop a checklist that's comfortable for you. So that's the end goal for me. If you do have any questions in regards to this investing checklist, if you have any ideas, I'd love to hear them. So leave it in the comment section of this video. Otherwise, I'm not an investing advisor. If you do need an advisor or some questions asked or anything, make sure you seek out someone who is qualified and can speak to your own 
financial needs. That's it for this video. Have a good day. Bye.